Welcome to the Conceptual Faculty, Lecture 2 in the Atlas University Survey of Reason and How We Gain Knowledge. I'm William R. Thomas. In the last lecture, we considered the role of reason in our lives and our culture. We saw how pervasive reason is in all the achievements of civilization. And we saw that in the modern era, even as reason has created miracles of science and technology, philosophers such as David Hume and Immanuel Kant have brought reason under attack, questioning whether we can be rational and have objective knowledge of reality at all. To begin to answer those challenges, in this lecture, I want to ask, what does reason basically consist of? We'll be discussing the ways in which we as humans can be aware of the world around us and how we categorize what we're aware of and how our means of knowing relate to language. Let me begin with language. Language is one of the distinguishing characteristics of human beings. No other animal has a language, but all human societies do. We store and share our knowledge in the form of language in books and courses. Our social systems depend on communication through language, on rules, laws, and regulations we formulate in terms of language. Heck, I'm using language right now to teach you something. And I'm working from a philosophy I learned through language from reading books. In fact, we consider the use of language a basic sign of normal human development. If a child can't learn to speak, it's a sign something is grievously wrong. And I suppose you all have heard of the Turing test. It's the test defined by Alan Turing, one of the creators of the computer, that's meant to establish whether a computer is intelligent, whether a computer is rational, whether it has reason. How does the Turing test measure intelligence? Basically, it considers a computer intelligent if a human being can't distinguish the computer from another human being simply on the basis of how each uses language. You know, they actually run this test each year in England. Human panelists sit at computer terminals and they interact by text with a person or a computer. They don't know which. On the other side are computer programs that can sound very human and humans trying very hard not to sound robotic. So far, no computer has passed the test, but the gap in terms of language skills is closing. So is man a linguistic animal? Is language use the defining trait of human beings? Is language the true mark of reason? No, it isn't. The defining trait of man is what explains our ability to use language, and that's reason, or more precisely, our conceptual faculty. Our knowledge, which we learn through language and share through language, spans across time, across persons, and across space. It covers the history of the universe and what you did today. But what makes our knowledge meaningful, what allows us to understand such far-ranging matters, is not language as such. It's not text and sounds. I mean, parrots can say, Oh, you're crazy! You're crazy! But they don't mean it. That's because it's concepts that give our language meaning. And parrots lack concepts for you and crazy, even though they can make the sounds. Now, concepts are the mental contents that connect words to the things the words mean. We use spoken words and concrete symbols of all sorts, generally, to hold in mind a grouping of things, like dogs. Say you were looking at some dogs. If you spoke English, you would call each one a dog. If you spoke Spanish, you would use the term un perro. If you speak Mandarin Chinese, the term would be ijigo. But it's the mental integration, the connection in your mind between the creatures and the word that's the concept. Similarly, you may hear me go, hee hee, ha ha, ho ho. And you may hear me go, ha 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 ha. If you have the concept for that action, you can use the word laugh in English, or reírse in Spanish, or xiao in Mandarin Chinese, to mark it and nail it down in your memory. 
The point is it doesn't matter what sound you make or how you write it down. What matters is the mental contents, the concept, and whether you formed it properly. So the power of human language is really the power of the conceptual faculty. Language is how we represent what we know, but it's not knowledge itself. In fact, conceptual knowledge, the knowledge we hold in the form of statements in language, is one kind of awareness we have, but it derives from and depends on a more basic kind of awareness we have, and that's perception. Conceptual knowledge and perception are both forms of awareness. They're cognitive states. Our awareness begins at the perceptual level. That's the awareness we have through our senses. And we can remember our perceptual experiences. And, but we can also rework what we remember in our imagination to project something that hasn't existed before, or that could exist, or that may never exist outside our minds. That's imagination. And then there's all the conceptual knowledge that we've been talking about not just individual concepts or languages, but theories and abstract reasoning generally, and logical reasoning and inference. These are the basic contents of a conceptual mind, from the perceptual to the conceptual level. And there's a strict relation of dependence here, because our direct contact with reality occurs entirely at the perceptual level. After all, how do you know you've come up against evidence? How can you tell if something's real? Well, you see it, or you touch it, or you can taste it, or smell it, or hear it. How can you tell where your body is in space? You just can. It's a sense you have, too, called proprioception, or body awareness. You don't believe me? Close your eyes. Now touch your nose. That's what I'm talking about. You knew exactly where your nose was even though your eyes were closed. Also, we have introspective awareness of what's going on in our minds, or at least of what we can introspect on directly. Introspection, though direct, isn't primary, because without mental contents, there would be nothing to introspect on. The scientific method recognizes the directness and fundamentality of perception. How do you test a scientific hypothesis? With an experiment. You test it in the lab, or you observe how it affects real subjects. You try to see if the results really hold, and I mean see, or otherwise confirm through direct perceptual experience. Or if you're gathering data, you know how to trace the data back to its basis. Perception is an integrated sensory experience. From your own perspective, your perception is nothing but the basic way you experience the world. One a way of focusing on perception is that it's what you would be aware of even if you didn't know a single word. Perception is the kind of awareness a mouse has or a bird has. We know now that each sense works through a physical and neurological mechanism. Consider how sight works, for example. Light falls on the rods and cones in our retinas and they react depending on the wavelength, which is the color in effect. Some philosophers have made much of this and have claimed that we're basically aware of sensations, points of light in the case of vision, or bits of this scent or that in the case of smell. That was David Hume's view, for example. But though our senses are aware via sensations, that's not what it's like to have perceptual experience. You don't see flashes of color and then guess that those must be a car coming down, you, down the road at you. You just see the car. That's the integrated perceptual experience of sight. Are you sitting or standing right now? Now, and when you're doing that, are you calculating your body position or do you just feel where you are and how you're oriented? Are you prickled by the atoms of the surface that you're on? No, you feel it as an integrated structure and texture. So to recap, perception is our direct awareness of reality. Since we have to deal with reality however we can, even bad senses would be great. But our senses are actually pretty good for dealing with the world we evolved in. But still, perception has some severe limitations. For one thing, perceptual awareness is the direct and immediate awareness of concrete particulars within the range of one's senses. 
It's awareness of one's immediate context. It's awareness of these sounds that you hear, the things you can see right in front of you, the sensations that you feel, any odd smells and tastes in the current position of your body parts. Perceptual awareness is limited to the moment and to particular concretes. The memory of past experiences can provide more context, and many perceptual animals have some amount of memory capacity. But at this level, one is still highly limited. One crucial limitation of the perceptual level is the crow epistemology. It's called the crow epistemology because of a classic story. If one hunter enters a wood, the crows fly away. If he leaves the wood, they all come back. But now if four hunters go in and then three come out, the crows, just limited to their perceptual awareness, can't see the difference. So they come back and then the remaining hunter shoots them. Let's put the crow epistemology on a human scale. Can you tell the difference between, say, a bag of 21 oranges and a bag with 22 oranges in it? I certainly couldn't, just looking at them. In fact, humans can only hold in perceptual awareness about 7 to 10 units. That's why you can remember lots of 7-digit telephone numbers, but you probably don't remember many 12-digit credit card numbers, do you? But conceptual knowledge lets us overcome these limitations. It amplifies our direct awareness, one might say. Conceptual knowledge is indirect, all right, but it has the virtue of being general. I was just talking about crows in general and human perceptual abilities in general, and I couldn't have done it without conceptual knowledge. My remarks extended far beyond the immediate context and any particular people and crows we've ever known. So conceptual knowledge isn't limited to the immediate context. And while it can't eliminate the limits of the crow, conceptual knowledge provides us with unit economy, which is a kind of a fix for the crow. We can conceptualize any number of units with one concept, which, represented by one word, is just one mental unit. None of us can hold a billion anything in mind bit by bit, but all of us can learn what a billion is and how to measure it. And with the word billion, we can refer to all of those billions of whatever we need to think about. That's the power of the conceptual faculty. It's the power of human reason. But how does conceptualization work? Many philosophers have detected a whiff of magic in it. See, there's a classic problem in philosophy, known as the problem of universals or the problem of, ab of abstraction. It asks, in effect, what justifies us going beyond the particular items we can perceive? To understand the nature of this problem, let's consider what a concept really is. Ayn Rand offered a basic definition of a concept in her essay, The Psychoepistemology of Art. She wrote this, a concept is a mental integration of two or more units which are isolated by a process of abstraction and united by a specific definition. With the exception of the proper names, every word we use is a concept. So a concept has two or more units. Unit, in objectivist concept theory, means a particular existent considered as belonging to a group. Existents like the dogs and laughs we considered earlier. Each dog is a unit of the concept dog, and each laugh is a unit of the concept laugh. So, for every well-formed concept, you need to be able to know how to distinguish the units from the non-units. Is a cat a dog? No. Is a snort a laugh? I don't think so. A definition is a way to remember how to tell what's in a concept and what's out. A good definition will zero in on the most essential characteristics that the units have, that distinguish them from other things you know about. Okay. Let's look more closely at the magic of concepts. While the things that exist in reality are particular and concrete, conceptual meaning is universal and abstract. These don't mean the same thing. Concepts are universal in that they refer to all their units, however many units there may be. If I say baseballs are small and hard, I mean all baseballs at any time 
anywhere. How many is that? I have no idea. Since more baseballs are being made all the time, it's an open-ended number, really. Conceptual awareness is abstract, by contrast, because it integrates qualitatively different things into a single new mental unit. When we form a concept, we imagine that all the units are the same, or same enough for our purposes. I mean, consider a set of balls, a whole variety of them. They sure are different, aren't they? But they're all balls. We've abstracted from their differences in size, form, color, weight, hardness, and so on. By the way, earlier I said that conceptual knowledge was general. General, as I was using it, abstracted from the difference between universality and abstractness. Now, many philosophers have wondered how concepts could be objective while somehow being universal and somehow being abstract in their meaning. Some have said that all the balls had to share a nature. They had to have something particular in common. But these balls really don't share anything in particular. They aren't made of the same material. They don't have quite the same shapes or dimensions. They aren't all used in the same way. They don't wear a tag saying, we are balls, put us in the ball category. So other philosophers have said, it's deuces wild. You want to call those balls? OK. But what if we toss the moon into the mix? What do you think? Maybe that should be included? Maybe we should throw it out? Is the moon a ball? A toddler might point to the ball in the sky, daddy. Is the earth a big blue marble? Some philosophers want to say it doesn't matter. We can just make it up however we want. The moon is a ball if we want it to be. Or maybe we need a new word, a moo ball. Well, Ayn Rand had an answer to the challenge of the problem of universals. That is, the problem of abstraction. Ayn Rand showed how the magic works. She explained how it was possible to have objective concepts based in the facts while recognizing that we aren't forced to categorize existence in any particular way. If you lived in the jungle, maybe you would never have a need to conceptualize a ball. Rand's answer to the problems of universals and abstraction is her theory of measurement omission. In her introduction to objectivist epistemology, she explained it this way. A concept is a mental integration of two or more units having the same distinguishing characteristic or characteristics with their particular measurements omitted. Ayn Rand used the example of tables. Consider the tables in your childhood home. They weren't all the same, but they varied within a delimited range. They were human scale, and they had a flat upper surface, which was supported above the floor. Anything with those kind of traits is a table, and we can ignore exactly how tall they might be as long as they fall within the range. And we can ignore what they're made of, as long as they're sufficiently sturdy. And we can ignore how many legs they have, as long as they stand up. Notice that all these traits of the tables that I've just been talking about are measurable. The traits are things like lengths, textures, colors, hardness, position, and shape. These are the measurements Rand is talking about. But are you literally measuring all these many dimensions? Not mathematically, that's for sure. I mean, toddlers learn the concept for table before they can count past five. For many concepts, like table, our perceptual system does the measuring. We can see how similar the shapes are. We can feel how hard and solid a surface is. For more complex concepts, such as scientific concepts like the atom, something we can't see, we have to do explicit mathematical conscious measuring. But however we do it, it's our awareness of these measurements that makes our concepts meaningful. It's what makes them objective. The units really do fall within a delimited range. They really are more similar to each other in the relevant dimensions than are other things. There's a real difference between tables and chairs. I'd like to clarify a bit of terminology here. Now, Ayn Rand says that the units have the same distinguishing characteristics. Well, she doesn't mean that they're literally the same, just that they're relevantly similar as compared with the contrast objects you want to distinguish them from. 
And I'd also like to emphasize the word relevantly. You see, we form concepts to serve our human purposes. Reality gives us things the way they are. If we care to, we can try to divide those things into groups, not higgledy-piggledy, but based on the real traits they have in common. Nothing forces us to form concepts except the way the world is and the fact that we need to deal with it. Let's come back now to the balls we were looking at before. How does Rand's measurement omission theory work here? Well, what do these balls have in common? That they're rounded, that you could throw them in a pinch. But you know this, right? You wouldn't abuse the concept, would you? Would you say that all balls fly straight? But you know a wiffle ball doesn't. And would you say a ball rolls evenly? Any ball? Even an American football? Still, they're similar enough to talk about them with some generality. And that's why the moon doesn't really fit. It has a superficial similarity of shape, but you couldn't hold it. You couldn't throw it or kick it. It's not human scale, but a ball is. And Rand's measurement emission theory also shows us why we can't really make up a new concept, the moo ball, because the moon and the balls have to have something in common. They have to share traits that fall within a range. But what does a football or a wiffle ball have in common with the moon? They aren't even spheres, and the football and the wiffle ball are human products. But the moon was formed by nature. To use a concept, you have to know what would qualify as a new unit. This is why it's important to define what we mean, what measurements we've omitted, what distinguishing shared characteristics we've been able to clearly identify. We should be able to say what counts as a unit and what doesn't and why. A ball, as we've seen, is a kind of toy or plaything. It's rounded and designed to be thrown or struck or kicked by a person. That's a definition, that it's a ball is a plaything that's rounded, it's designed to be thrown, struck, or kicked by a person. It helps keep the balls apart from rounded rocks and planets and shuttlecocks and other things we might confuse them with. So to review, we have direct perceptual awareness, but it's limited to the current context and relies on not much more ability to hold things in mind than a crow has. But the conceptual knowledge that we have is the way our minds break out of that trap. It's how we become rational, able to reason universally, able to abstract from varied particulars based on their falling within an essential and relevant range of measurements. This lets us integrate the full context of our experiences and our other knowledge. Although we can only do it abstractly, we can't hold it all in our minds at once, thanks to the crow. But we do jujitsu on the crow, and we use abstraction to hold a vast range of units in mind through unit economy, a billion or more if we like, while we use up just a few of the limited mental resources we have. We've hacked the crow with unit economy. Now let's move on. So far, we've been discussing examples of first-level concepts, like dog and laugh and ball. These are concepts one can form directly from the similarities and differences one observes in perception. A child doesn't learn the word ball or dog theoretically. He learns the meaning of those words from what he can see and hear. Often, one doesn't know how to define a first-level concept. That's because we usually make a tacit, subconscious comparison of measurements of similarity and difference along the various dimensions that serve to differentiate the units from all other things. We aren't prepared, usually, to analyze and unpack what lies behind a first-level concept, even though we can use it just fine. That's why it probably seemed a little strange to be defining the word ball. But the vast majority of the words we use are not first-level concepts or even if they began that way, they aren't anymore. When we start saying that a ball is something you can use in a game, well, a game isn't a first-level concept. We're using an abstraction to form an abstraction. Let me explain. If you saw some kids running around, how could you tell that they were playing a game? From how they looked? Here's a definition of the word game. A game is a recreational activity with internal goals constituted by its rules. 
you know, like in tag, the rules say that one kid is it and has to chase the others. The rules say if you make it to home base, you're safe. But you can't understand those rules or what the game is uh, by just how the kids look. The rules are conceptual. They're abstract. And so is the word game. It's abstract. When we abstract from abstractions, we can subdivide a concept or we can treat that concept as a unit in a more abstract concept. It's worth noting that more and less abstract are relative terms. First level concepts, the concepts we form directly from perception, are the entry point and they're where the rubber hits the road. But they can be formed at many different relative levels of abstraction. Could a child form the concept of animal or beastie before forming concepts of species like dogs and cats? Well, maybe if he didn't have much exposure to animals, maybe they would all seem very similarly wild and scary. Or while one child might learn tree first, another child who was raised in the woods might form pine, oak, and maple first. We can see the effect of context on different languages. Earlier, I gave the example of English, Spanish, and Chinese words for dog and laugh. And people who speak different languages do share many concepts that pick out the same units. But they, but they are also concepts unique to different languages, ones that don't directly translate. We see these also in the slang of small groups. In fact, many families have their own odd concepts. And individuals do too, because concept formation in the end is an individual act based in an individual's context and choices. So we don't always start with the same first level concepts. But wherever we start, once we begin to use abstractions to create new concepts, we need to be attentive to the way our concepts depend on each other. Certain highly abstract concepts, and by this I mean distant from the, the, per, the perceptual level, uh, concepts like good and reasonable, free and just, these concepts end up playing a hugely influential role in our thinking because of how they affect so many other concepts and choices that we make. So I'd like to look at an extended example of conceptual hierarchies to see how concepts interrelate. In this example, we'll take as our starting point the concept of man, the rational animal. Well, to understand this definition, we need to know what is an animal and what is rational. It's not just a matter of a definition. This is how you distinguish human beings, actually. Uh, human, uh, an animal uh, could be an abstraction that you formed from dog and cat and ape, etc. Actually, to form the concept of man, one doesn't need the concept of animal as such. We need to be able to tell men from apes, dogs, and cats. But to form the concept of animal, we would have to step back from these differences and see what apes, dogs, and cats have in common as compared with, say, grass and trees. This is where the concepts of organism and locomotion become relevant. Organism is how we identify the broader class that grass, trees, and animals are in. And locomotion, the ability to move around autonomously, is what animals have in common and the grass and trees don't. Now we also saw that to define man, we needed to know what rational means. We need the concept of reason. In other words, that is, the concept of the rational faculty. We saw that animals are set off against other living things, other organisms. So the key concept here turns out to be the concept of life. We can subdivide the concept of man, too, into professions, for example, like lawyer. In a sense, as a species of the concept man, lawyer is less abstract. But it could only be identified on the basis of other abstract concepts. You see, the idea of a profession depends on the concept of reason again. Because a profession presupposes an education and a principled way of seeking a living. But education and principles are features of reason. Finally, we see that we couldn't understand the idea of law, to be a lawyer is to work with the law, without the idea of government, since what is the law without some means of enforcing it? 
With all these relations of dependence on our highly abstract ideas, it becomes very clear how crucial it is that we objectively define our concepts and that we understand the order of dependence among them. But this is hard work, and our schools don't do the best job of training people to think conceptually and objectively. And frankly, a lot of people just don't want to bother with it. Our culture, indeed, all of human culture, has been plagued by what Ayn Rand called the anti-conceptual mentality. We've seen that perception is easy, and children are primed to learn language, so they just hoover up first-level abstractions when they're young. But as they get older, the more they need to move beyond the first level and think in terms of highly abstract concepts. And then it's much easier to talk than to think. It's much easier to parrot the abstract sounding terms they hear others use. After all, a lot of early language learning begins with mimicry. Rand described the anti-conceptual mentality as a mentality which decided at a certain point of development that it knows enough and doesn't care to look further. This saves the effort of integrating one's knowledge into abstract principles and of making sure that one knows what those abstract principles and the concepts that underlie them are made of. We see the anti-conceptual mentality all around us. We see it in college students who demand free education without considering how it will be provided or who will pay for it. We see it in status politicians who view the economy as a pie. That's much easier than understanding the economy as a dynamic locus of voluntar voluntary production and trade by free individuals. We see it, too, in the people who seek moral certainty and the idea that there's a father in the sky who makes all the rules, an idea that basically punts on the need to consider why we need morals in the first place. To be human is to be conceptual. One can't live effectively on the human scale without using abstractions intensively and precisely. And that's why it's vital to understand how the conceptual faculty works and what skills it needs to function well. Equally vital is understanding the basic methods of objectivity. Those methods begin with Ayn Rand's question for concepts. What facts of reality gave rise to this concept? Facts of reality, that's where we start at least, when we're living on the conceptual level, using our conceptual faculty, using reason.